Before we get started with our video today, I just want to say that I hope everyone is staying safe wherever you are. I know how ridiculous it is to be talking about cameras and photography at a time like this, but I also do think that we should all go on with our lives without panic and fear, especially at a time like this. So let us all keep calm and watch YouTube. Thank you. So today we're going to be talking about point and shoot cameras. Are point and shoot cameras still worth it? Point and shoot digital cameras have been very, very popular starting maybe early 2000s, but you just don't see them anymore because not a lot of people buy cameras because we all have very good smartphones and very good cameras nowadays. So uh, a lot of people may not feel the need to spend the extra money on a camera to be able to take decent photos. And if you are someone interested in photography and you want to do it seriously, you probably want to get a DSLR, which would typically cost a little more than a point and shoot camera, but will be much more versatile in the long run. So today I have a fun little comparison for you. I'm going to be comparing three different cameras, my smartphone, the iPhone 11 Pro Max, and the Canon G7X Mark III, which is a point and shoot camera, and the Canon M50, which is an interchangeable lens mirrorless camera. I know I said DSLR in the title, and this is not a DSLR, this is a mirrorless camera, but technically all these three cameras are mirrorless cameras, so I just called it a DSLR. So we're gonna take a look at some photos and videos from these cameras and see if point and shoot cameras can still provide any meaningful benefits over smartphones, or if you should just skip this and get a more proper camera. Well, I say this is a proper camera, but the irony here is that the M50 is actually the cheapest and the oldest camera here. Uh, it's actually about $600 brand new, and the G7X Mark III is about $750. And the iPhones nowadays are pretty expensive, and this particular phone was about $1,300, I think. But with an interchangeable lens camera, you have to keep in mind that there are just so many different options, and also depending on the lens that you're using, the price of the overall package might vary greatly. So I wanted to give the smartphones and the point and shoot cameras a fair chance here. So I didn't choose like an old and cheap and useless models. And instead of comparing them to like a $5,000 camera, I picked the M50, which is a pretty reasonably priced entry level camera. And just keep in mind that this is not exactly a review or comparison of these particular cameras. We're just comparing the general differences in image quality between a smartphone and a point and shoot camera and an interchangeable lens camera. So. Before we begin, let's take a look at some technical specs. The iPhone 11 Pro Max has a 12 megapixel camera, and in fact, it has three 12 megapixel cameras with three different lenses, but except with the portrait mode, I'm only gonna use the middle one because that's the best one, and it has the most common focal length for most smartphone cameras. And the camera has a 4.25 millimeter f1.8 lens, and because of the size of the sensor, that's a 26 millimeter full frame equivalent. And if you don't really know what that means, you don't really have to worry about that right now, but if you do want to learn more about camera sensors and focal lengths, uh, I have a pretty good video about that, so I'll put the link down in the description so you can check that out later. The Canon G7X Mark III has a 1 inch 20.2 megapixel sensor, which is much bigger than a smartphone sensor. Depending on the price, some point and shoot cameras may have a smaller or a bigger sensor, but at this price range, one inch sensor is pretty common. And apart from the form factor, I think that's the biggest difference between any cameras and smartphones. Smartphones are obviously meant for so many other things other than just taking pictures, so the uh, real estate that phone manufacturers can dedicate to camera sensors is quite limited. But with real cameras, that's obviously not an issue. Without getting too technical, with bigger sensors, you can generally expect better image quality, especially in low light situations. But smartphones have been overcoming the handicap by using uh, better software processing. A lot of smartphones like iPhone and Google Pixel now have night mode, which enhances the image quality in dark environments, which has been the weakness of many smartphone cameras. The G7X also has an 8.8 to 36.8 millimeter f1.8 to 2.8 zoom lens, which is about 24 to 100 millimeter full frame equivalent. 
All the photos and videos taken by DG7X in this video were shot at the widest focal length to maintain the 1.8 aperture, which will produce the best image quality. The M50 has a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor, which is even bigger than a one inch sensor. Keep in mind that the M50 is about two years old now, so it would be interesting to see exactly how much difference the bigger sensor can make here. With the M50 or any interchangeable lens cameras, the performance will vary greatly depending on the lens that you use with the camera. I'm going to be using two lenses with the M50. One is the 15-45 to lens that comes with the M50 kit and the other is the Sigma 16mm f1.4 which I reviewed a few weeks ago. Let's take a look at the first image. Here we have the iPhone photo on the left, G7X image in the middle and the M50 on the right. The iPhone image is taken in the default camera app on the phone since that's how most people take photos with their smartphones with the smart HDR feature enabled. The images from the G7X and the M50 are the raw files straight out of the camera without any processing. And here you can see the images that I revised to match the exposure and saturation of the iPhone photo. In the real world, if you shoot JPEGs in auto mode with these cameras, your images might come out more similar to the iPhone's photos, but I'm just trying to show you the best examples of what the cameras are actually capturing and what these photos can be. At a first glance, these photos look very similar and if you look at these photos on your phone, you probably won't be able to tell the difference. But if you zoom in all the way, you can see the difference in sharpness and noise level. The M50's image looks the best here thanks to the bigger 24 megapixel sensor and the G7X's image also looks much sharper than the iPhone's photo but it is much more noisy. Here's another photo. Here the iPhone's photo came out darker because it was trying to retain the details of what's outside the window so I reduced the brightness and took the photo again and it looked much more similar to the other two. Here's another example but this time because of the iPhone's smart HDR feature the iPhone was able to capture more details in the shadow while also retaining the details outside the window. I'm not saying that the iPhone's photo here is visually more pleasing or realistic, but I'm just explaining why these photos look like what they look like. You can also see some more eye patterns on the iPhone photo here. This isn't necessarily because it was taken with a smartphone camera, this also happens on some expensive cameras, but here the G7X and the M50 managed it very well. And here I pulled back the shadows in the other photos and as you can see the cameras did a good job retaining the details. Now let's take a look at some low light shots. Here the room was actually much darker than what's shown in the photos here and as you can see the iPhone photo looks very good but there seems to be a lot of noise reduction happening here but overall pretty good for a smartphone camera. The G7X's image also looks very good here thanks to the 1.8 aperture and it is a bit noisy but that's because I didn't apply any noise reduction and this is also just straight out of the camera. And the M50 actually looks the worst here because I'm using the 15-45 to kit lens which has the maximum aperture of 3.5. So I'm shooting this at ISO 12800 which is why it's so noisy. And here is where it gets really interesting. With the night mode enabled, the iPhone's image now looks a hundred times better than before. I promise you all these photos were taken in the same lighting. And now I'm going to change the lens on my M50. And now with the Sigma lens, the M50's image is looking much better than the G7X's and that shows you the importance of lenses in photography. Here they are zoomed in and when I match the exposure to the iPhone's photo, the difference becomes much more obvious. And here's another example of night mode on the iPhone and you may not think this is anything special, but here's what the room actually looks like with my eyes. And here it is next to the G7X, which also did a pretty decent job, but it is not as clean as the iPhone's photo. The night mode also has a weakness though, because smartphones have to rely on slow shutter speed and image stacking to compensate for the smaller sensor. It is extremely difficult to take pictures of moving objects, and even when you're taking pictures of a sleeping dog, you have to keep your camera incredibly still, or your photos will come out blurry like this. So with other cameras, your photos may not look as good right out of the camera but you definitely have more control in various situations. 
With video, it's a very different story. With video, it's much harder to apply software processing than still photos, so the raw power of the camera sensors matter much more. So as you can see, the iPhone is struggling in such a poor lighting, but in good lighting, like with photos, the differences will be much less noticeable. And next, let's talk about background blur, which is another benefit of using cameras with bigger sensors. Background blur can give you some nice subject separation, especially when you're shooting portraits. This happens because when the lens's aperture is wide open, the depth of field becomes shallower, which basically means that what's not in focus in the photo will be more blurry. A lot of smartphones today have portrait modes, which mimics this by masking the background around the main subject. But as you can see, it is not always very accurate and at least to most photographers, they look very unnatural. And here's another example just to prove my point. The G7 X's photo looks quite nice here with its 1.8 aperture and the M50's photo doesn't look bad either, even with its 3.5 kit lens. But with the Sigma lens, as you can see, the background just melts away nicely. And here's another example just to show you the difference in the amount of background blur. And as you can see in the next examples, a good lens can add so much more quality to the photos that smartphone cameras can't quite capture yet. A point and shoot camera like the G7X Mark III is also much better at this than smartphones because it has a very good lens. But if you want the real deal, you should get yourself a proper camera and a proper lens. So to summarize, higher end smartphone cameras today are indeed very, very good and they're also very easy to use. So if you're someone who doesn't necessarily understand the basics of photography or if you're mainly going to be shooting in auto and if you're not going to be editing your photos very much, I think your smartphone photos will be very, very comparable um, or sometimes even better than your camera photos. With real cameras, only once you get to the level where you can really customize your cameras to your liking and also edit your photos and after also perhaps buying some more lenses will you start to see more meaningful differences from your smartphone photos. With video, again, in good lighting, you're really not gonna see a huge difference in image quality between any of these cameras, but in poor lighting, uh, the smartphone's smaller sensor became a huge drawback and even the cheapest camera here, the M50, with its cheap kit lens performed a lot better than the smartphone. So if you do want a real camera, should you get yourself a point and shoot camera or an interchangeable lens camera? Well, I think that all depends on your needs and if, you, if this is your first camera, I don't think you can go seriously wrong with either cameras. If you want something smaller and more compact that you can carry it anywhere with you like a smartphone, then a point and shoot camera still provides a very good value. And if you want to get into photography more seriously and you want to try different lenses, then just get an interchangeable lens camera. And with a point and shoot camera, you obviously want a camera that can outperform your smartphone and otherwise it's just a waste of money. And for it to be able to do that, I think you should spend at least about six or $700. And there are much better point and shoot cameras than this that cost over a thousand dollars. And you can obviously get whatever you want, but we're we're talking about value here and if you want to pay more for a better camera that's fine too but in terms of image quality your return on your investment may be a lot lower with DSLRs or interchangeable lens mirrorless cameras um, there are just so many different variables so many different camera body options and also lenses uh, but if you're looking for your first camera if you buy any camera body between maybe 500 to a thousand dollars and if you spend a little more on lenses I think you'd be okay more expensive cameras may come with more features but in terms of image quality you're really not going to see a huge difference and the bigger difference will come from your lenses not camera bodies and most beginners don't really need to worry about that right now so what do you guys think? Do you think point and shoot cameras are still relevant today? What is your choice of camera? Let me know in the comment down below and that's it for me today and thank you for watching. Bye bye.